On a hot summer night in 1969, at a house on a hill overlooking Los Angeles, some of the same girls who once sang sweetly about souls locked in harmony unleashed Helter Skelter. Is she a nice girl? No. Is she an animal? I think she was then, and I, I fear that she still is. I feel like if I am released, it will be because I deserved it. And if I'm not, then I, you know, I'll be able to handle that also. Leslie Van Houten was only 19 when she participated in the killing of Rosemary LaBianca in 1969. So this is her address written in her hand. It'll be one of the last times she writes this address. Because anywhere from five to 14 days, she will no longer be an inmate in California prison. It brings it all up again to all our family. It's, it's horrific. Planned, it was conspiracy, uh, it was gory, and my, my cousin was tortured for days. Leslie Van Houten is an American convicted murderer and a former member of the Manson family. During her time with Manson, Van Houten was arrested and charged in relation to the 1969 murder of Lino and Rosemary LaBianca. Leslie Louise Van Houten was born on August 23, 1949 in the Los Angeles suburb of Altadena to Paul and Jane Van Houten. Her father is of Dutch descent and her mother is of Irish, English, Scottish and German descent. She grew up in a middle-class church-going family, along with an older brother and two adopted siblings, a brother and a sister who were Korean. Her mother and father divorced when she was 14, which led her to begin smoking marijuana and around the age of 15, taking LSD. At 17, she ran away with her boyfriend at the High Ashbury neighborhood of San Francisco, but returned to complete high school, graduating from Monrovia High School in Monrovia, California. In 1967, according to Van Houten, she discovered that she was pregnant and was ordered by her mother to undergo an abortion and bury the fetus in their backyard. Van Houten stated that after this event, she felt very removed from her mother and accumulated intense anger toward her, which may had a hand in her becoming a hippie, living at a commune, and later she phoned her mother to say she was dropping out and would not be making contact again. After a few months in the commune in Northern California, Van Houten met Catherine Scher and Bobby Bosley and moved in with them and another woman during the summer of 1968. Then after a while, the four broke up for jealous arguments and Scher left to join Charles Manson's commune and 19-year-old Van Houten followed her. Leslie Van Houten was also becoming restless with the conventions of suburban middle-class life. The homecoming princess who sang in the church choir. Yeah. Remember her? Yeah. A little. A little bit, yeah. You had a good family life. There was trouble in the family yeah. when your father left. But, but you had so much going for you then. I seemed to want more... Um, living out of life than what was expected of young girls at that time. Drugs, sex, you know, breaking away from the norm. A year after graduation, she heard about Charles Manson. That he was like Christ, and he had the answers, and that uh, I just really needed to go and, and meet him. And when you first saw him? for as twisted as it all got, you know, I really think that I felt that I had met someone that by being around him would have a positive change. During their stay from August 1968 onward at Span Ranch, Manson controlled all of their lives, deciding when they would eat, sleep and have sex, and with whom they would have sex. He also controlled the taking of LSD, giving followers larger doses than he himself took. Two years ago, the hippie commune led by Charles Manson moved into this old Wild West film set just outside Los Angeles. And it was here that they were living on the night the alleged murders took place.
According to Manson, when you take LSD enough times, you reach a state of nothing, of no thoughts. According to Van Houten, he became saturated in acid and could not grasp the existence of those living a non-psychedelic reality. I ended up with the blame of it. The real blame of it belongs to your society. There is a balance of uh, good and evil. There's good and there's evil, and then there's a dance in between. And then there's the fourth road, the one I walk on. Barbara Hoyt spoke at Van Houten's parole hearing in 2013. She said that Van Houten was considered a leader in the family. We, we had been isolated for so long from other people. The people at the Spahn's ranch didn't leave unless certain people were chosen to go downtown for the day to get food or whatever. Uh, it became a condensed amount of uh, group programming and thinking. And at the time, it was supposed to help people. It was supposed to start a revolution that would uh, clean the souls of everyone. And see, what Charlie would do is he would speak about people's souls and not their persons. And because we weren't tuned in enough, we couldn't see what he was talking about, so we would just have to take his word for it. And uh, that's, you know, that's what he said, that that next summer there would be this big revolution and that the chosen people would live in a hole in the middle of the desert. And then after the crimes, we went out and looked for the hole. Well, I had been taught then that there was no such thing as death. And it's hard for me to speak of it now because uh, I'm, I'm back to my normal way of thinking. And uh, now I can't conceive of it, but back then, uh, back then it wasn't supposed to mean anything. Death wasn't to mean anything. Van Houten was first portrayed by actress Kathy Payne in the 1976 made for TV film Helter Skelter and the 2009 film Leslie My Name is Evil is partially based on Van Houten's early life and stars actress Kristin Hager. In Helter Skelter 2004 remake, Van Houten was portrayed by actress Catherine Watkins. Van Houten was portrayed not only on those but a lot more films and TV series. On August 9, 1969, one day after Sharon Tate's murder, Van Houten, Tex Watson, Patricia Greenwinkle, Linda Casabian, Susan Atkins, Clem Grogan, and Charles Manson went to the house of Rosemary and Lino LaBianca. Manson entered the house with Watson and the others, then left with Casabian, Atkins, and Grogan. Van Houten and another woman held down Rosemary LaBianca as Watson stabbed Lino LaBianca. Then after stabbing Rosemary, Watson gave Van Houten a knife and she proceeded to stab the woman at least 14 more times. The word war was carved on Lino LaBianca's stomach and death to pigs was painted with their blood on the living room wall. In 1971, she testified saying, and I took one of the knives and Patricia Greenwinkle had one, a knife, and we started stabbing and cutting up the lady. Van Houten admitted that she helped hold La Bianca down while others stabbed her to death as the woman begged for her life. She spoke to ABC's Diane Sawyer in 1994 about how she attacked Rosemary La Bianca. I stabbed Mrs. La Bianca in the lower back about 16 times. What kind of punishment do you deserve? What is enough? I don't know when enough punishment will be enough for me. Manson, who denied responsibility, never explained the motive for the murder. But prosecutor Vincent Bagliosi suggested that Manson was attempting to start a racial civil war with the so-called Helter Skelter. The racial nature of the motive for murders Van Houten was convicted of was later adduced by a judge, increasing the gravity of her offense. At a parole hearing in 2016, Van Houten said the murder were the start of what Manson believed was a coming race war. He called Helter Skelter after the Beatles song. He had his follower prepare to fight and learn to can food so they could go underground and live in, in a hole in the desert. Pat to leave with him to LA and when he came
came back, he said that he had had a vision or an experience and that we would have to go back to L.A. and start preparing to save people from the revolution. Right. So, and then it was just two weeks before this took place that he started talking about murdering people to instigate the revolution? Right. Okay. Beginning it ourselves. And did everybody kind of go along with that? Yes. Nobody ever questioned him? Uh, no. A few people left. Um, a woman named Ella left. I can't remember, but a few people left. Some of them left because they no, didn't... No one ever spoke out. Okay. After we were all arrested, lots of people said they didn't believe in it, but they didn't indicate that at the time. Okay, so a lot of people said they didn't believe he'd actually do it, that he would go through with it. Is that what yeah, you Yeah, or okay. that they believed him or that they would have been participants, but that was not what they were saying at the time that it was going on. Van Houten later described holding down Rosemary Lapienka with a pillowcase over her head as others stabbed her, then ordered by Manson follower Charles Tex Watson to do something. Van Houten said she picked up a knife and stabbed the woman more than a dozen times in her lower back and glute area. On the night of August 9th, Manson once again set his followers on a target, this time the home of grocery chain owner Leno Labianca and his wife Rosemary. The group once again included Tex Watson and Patricia Krenwinkel, and for the first time, Leslie Van Houten. Manson himself escorted them to the house before leaving. I knew that people would die. I knew that there would be killing. Charles Manson told Lino and Rosemary LaBianca uh, not to worry, that he, it was just a robbery and he wasn't going to hurt them. He wasn't going to hurt them. Pat and I took Mrs. LaBianca into the bedroom. And um, the sounds of Mr. LaBianca dying came into the bedroom. When Mrs. LaBianca heard her husband being killed by Tex, she started um, calling out to him and yelling for him. And Tex came in and killed her. And then Tex turned me around and handed me the knife and he said, do something. Because Manson had told him to make sure that all of us got our hands dirty. And um, I stabbed Mrs. LaBianca in the lower back about 16 times. According to the New York Times citing parole record, after the murder, Van Houten changed clothes and drank chocolate milk from the couple's fridge. She wiped her fingerprints at that crime scene. She changed her clothes. She even drank chocolate milk from her victim's refrigerator. And she says that she did it as a follower of Manson's. Van Houten was convicted in 1971 of two counts of first-degree murder and one count of conspiracy to commit murder in the 1969 slaying of husband and wife, Lino and Rosemary Labianca. She was initially sentenced to death, but that was overturned in 1972 when California ruled the death penalty unconstitutional. After a series of mistrials, she was eventually handed down a life sentence with the possibility of parole for her role in the murder. Leslie Van Houten was originally sentenced to death for her role in the Manson murders, but her sentence was commuted to life in prison. At her first trial, Van Houten did not appear to take the court seriously, later claiming to have been supplied with LSD during the trial. She laughed during the testimony about the victims. She testified to committing the murder and denied that Manson had been involved. An often cited example of how he seemed to exert control over Van Houten and the others was when Manson carved an X on his forehead and she and the others copied him in the later stage of the trial. They stopped mimicking him, Bagliosi suggested because they realized it was making the extent of his influence over them apparent. The entire proceedings were scripted by Charlie. Every day we'd meet and he'd decide, well, today I want you each to stand up and hold your hands in some stupid symbols. You're going to get up and scream, the old gray mare. You're going to get up and earn an X in your head. You're going to go bald. And that day we proceeded through the events as he said it. Hello. Van Houten dismissed three defense lawyers in succession for claiming her actions were attributed to both Manson's control over her. 
when her lawyer was asking an expert witness about the effect of LSD on judgment. Van Houten shouted that this is all such a big lie. I was influenced by the war in Vietnam and TV. During the sentence in face of the trial, in an apparent attempt to exhort Manson, Van Houten testified that she had committed a killing in which she was not in fact involved. He told the psychiatrist that she were beating her adopted sister, leading him to characterize her as psychology loaded gun, and was adamant that Manson had no influence over her thought process and behavior. Van Houten also told the psychiatrist that she would have gone to jail for manslaughter or assault with a deadly weapon without ever meeting Manson. In cross-examination, Van Houten aggressively inflicted herself in inflicting wounds while the victim was living and severely wounding the victim and denied acting on extraction from Manson. In 1977, Van Houten was granted a retrial due to the failure to declare a mistrial when her lawyer died. Her defense argued that Van Houten's capacity for rational thought had been diminished due to LSD use and Manson's influence. The jury could not agree on a verdict, according to what the jury later told reporters, and they thought it was difficult on the basis of the evidence to determine whether Van Houten's judgment had been impaired enough for a verdict of first-degree murder rather than manslaughter. It was reported in the news media that because of the time already served, Van Houten could go free that year if she was convicted of manslaughter. By law, prosecutors are not allowed to mention the possibility of defendant being released on parole when arguing for murder rather than manslaughter conviction because it is considered highly prejudicial to the defendant and her second trial ended with a mistrial. The prosecution in 1970-71 had emphasized that the motive had nothing to do with robbery and the killer ignored valuable pieces of property. At Van Houten's secondary trial, the prosecution, who were now being aided by a specialist in diminished responsibility, altered the charges by using the theft of food, clothing, and a small sum of money taken from the house to add a charge of robbery. She was on bond for six months before being found guilty of first-degree murder. Van Houten was given a life sentence with the possibility of parole. This is Frontera, California, home of the California Institute for Women, the largest women's prison in California. Leslie Van Houten has spent the last 12 years here. She's doing her time in rooms like this one. Van Houten is in medium custody, the lowest security level allowed as a first-degree murderer. These surroundings are a long way from what a young Leslie Van Houten experienced as a middle-class teenager in Altadena, California. I feel that in my trials, my second and third trials, there was a great deal of testimony by psychiatrists that led enough to a defense that the second trial was hung for 30 days, five manslaughter and seven first. It was when in my third trial felony murder, which is robbery murder, was read. There were four separate instru instructions requested by the people. They were read to the jury. The felony murder, robbery murder, states that my state of mind at the time of the crime negates, in other words, because it's a robbery, my state of, the mi my state of mind at the time is not important. And Mr. K in the past has even said in this room, that he agrees 100% that it was not a robbery. So I believe that the psychiatric testimony that offered that I was not as capable as I am today in 1969 is one reason that I could be considered for parole without diminishing the fact that these were horrible acts that were committed. The second thing is that the crime was committed during an unusual period of time not to reoccur. I was 19. I was a drifting hippie already with a history of using marijuana. I ran into a man who had just gotten out of prison, was very seasoned, and enjoyed using people. I've worked very hard in my therapy to understand that relationship and to move on from it. The third thing is that during the committing of the crime that I was under extreme mental stress. And if 
there's been any evidence at all or understanding of abusive relationships and cults. There was extreme stress at that time in my life. The autopsy report verifies that there were superficial stab wounds in the lower back of Mrs. LaBianca. I have consistently testified and taken um, responsibility for those. The district attorney's office never presented any evidence that would refute what I have said. And so it's a matter of, I believe, my consistency long before I ever heard of an autopsy report or anything else, that those wounds were post-mortem and they were at the lower, lower torso. So any reference to other wounds, there's been no evidence to that. I remember in court I said that I felt like a uh, shark just out of control for that moment. And um, I felt as though I were using all the strength I had and I was very surprised that when the coroner's report was given that the um, wounds were um, superficial, that they uh, didn't penetrate that deeply. In total, Van Houten was ruled eligible for parole five times, but was blocked each time by the California Governor Office. She was found suitable for parole at her 22nd parole hearing in 2020, but the decision was reversed by Governor Gavin Newsom. California is one of only two U.S. states in which a governor can reverse a parole board decision. Van Houten appealed the decision and it was overturned on May 30, 2023 by the California 2nd District Court of Appeal. On 47-year-old Van Houten is free. It says with reference to the present offense, the defendant queried what's to say about it when they were, you were discussing the crime. I didn't kill anybody. The only reason I feel I'm sentenced to death because I didn't talk against Charlie. I think he's a decent man. Uh, could you comment on, on that statement you made? Yeah, I, um, back then I did. You know, I feel that I was still very um, hooked into him and his philosophies, and I defended him. How do you feel about him now? I feel that he's a very pitiful and pathetic human being, and that um, I'm very sorry that people still continue to give him attention that his only danger is in the attention he's given. If he were ignored and left alone, he would um, probably just fade away. In your initial evaluations, your psychological evaluations, May 1971, you were saying that um, you were rationalizing regarding your behavior and saying that people that killed in Vietnam, what's the difference you killed these people? Yes. And, and uh, saying that you felt that you did something right. Yes. Have you gained some insight into why you held those beliefs? Yes. Would you like to share that with us? I, I believe that because I believe that Manson was Jesus Christ and that it was something that had to be done. It was like war. And we were going through combat training at the ranch and um, really prepped like that. And your belief system led you to believe that someone who was Jesus Christ would instigate racial wars between blacks and whites? Yeah, he said that it was the blacks' turn, that the white had been on top for too long, and all they ever did was put harm on other people that were not like them, and that the last time he came, he had been crucified, and this time he would have to make himself known. When was it, how long ago was it that you discovered that, that was not the proper way to think? Well, probably about 18 years ago. How have you dealt with that issue, that whole issue? It's been very hard for me. It hasn't been until the last couple of years that I've even been able to consider that um, This sounds kind of foolish, but that I could be forgiven by God for what I had done. Part of my job at the ranch when Charlie would be in the tub was to read from him, to him from the Bible. And it's been a very difficult thing for me to um, find forgiveness. 
as I mentioned a couple times in the reading of this decision, is very heinous. And uh, you dug yourself quite a hole, and it's going to take a little time to, uh, to get out of it. So, any comments from uh, Commissioner Cito? Good to see you again. It's nice to see you too. Mr. Smith? Well, I wish you good luck. Thank you. Good luck to you. Thank that you. concludes, sir. All right, thank you. The goodbyes are strikingly civil, but the California Parole Board decision is definitive. Once again, Leslie Van Houten has been denied parole. She will be eligible again in two years. Leslie Van Houten was denied parole for the 14th time. She's currently serving a life sentence for the 1969 murders of Leno and Rosemary LaVianca. They were killed in a horribly brutal fashion. How long have you been here, this prison? I've been in this prison, um, I've been back from bail 15, maybe 16 years. You were out for a while, right? Yes, I was, and um, I came to this prison in 71, I believe, on death row. And then in um, 76, I was given a reversal of my first trial, and I was out to court, and then I bailed, and then I came back, so. And found guilty after the second trial, right? Yes. No, the third trial. Third I trial. had a hung jury in my second trial. There's, is it a death row? No, they've moved it. There used to be, but they've moved it up to another um, facility up north. Well, the parole board has actually found her suitable to be released prior to this. She's had five denials, and this is the last one that was overturned by the Court of Appeals. They found that the governor could not deny her parole because she had been sufficiently rehabilitated and no longer posed a danger to society. The transitionary housing here is really designed to prepare people for life on the outside once they've been incarcerated. She'll be there for a year, and then she'll have two additional years on parole at whatever suitable housing she's able to procure during this first year. Governor Newsom said he wouldn't fight the decision to grant her parole. Governor Newsom reversed Mrs. Van Houten's parole grant three times since taking office and defended against her challenges of those decisions in court. Ellen Mellon, spokesperson for the governor's office, said in a statement obtained by People. The governor is disappointed by the Court of Appeals' decision to release Mrs. Van Houten, but will not pursue further action as efforts to further appeal are unlikely to succeed. 21 times she went before the parole board but was denied. Her attorney says Van Houten did the work to really understand how she could do what she did. Not blaming it on Manson, not blaming it on the cult, not blaming it on her youth, but taking responsibility. And the reason why that's important is with that comes the sense of guilt. Five times the parole board granted her release, but Governor Brown and more recently Governor Newsom blocked it. A state appeals court in May ruled she should be released in part because of support of family and friends and her plans once paroled. It's not just open, you know, open the gates and let her out. No, she is going into transitional living for a year. She has strict parole conditions. She has to, you know, meet, she has to be supervised. Anthony Di Maria, the nephew of murdered hairstylist Jay Spring, told CNN on July 11 that his family and other victims' families strongly disagree with California Governor Gavin Newsom's choice to not fight the court decision. Now, California's governor, Gavin Newsom, had previously rejected her parole three separate times, but this time he didn't fight it. I want to bring in Anthony Di Maria. His uncle, Jay Sebring, was one of the victims of the Manson family. Anthony, thank you for joining me this evening. You know, there's been a lot that has been talked about and said over the years, five decades worth and more. The nation, of course, has been fascinated by all that happened. It is unbelievable to think that this is a member of your own family who was one of the victims. Before we even begin, you know, tell me what you're feeling on a day like today, knowing that one more person is now freed. Well, the, the first thing is obviously I, I, my, my thoughts are with the victims, all the victims and all of our, uh, our families, because as Leslie collectively uh, tortured, conspired and killed her victims, so too our families are collectively bound by the loss and suffering of her crimes. And uh, it's clearly that, that Leslie Van Houten's release is, it profoundly impacts our families, but I fear 
that a very dangerous, pernicious precedent is established today that will impact millions of victims of violent crimes in, throughout the state of California today and uh, in the years to come. The precedent is established now. Uh, you have, uh, Leslie Van Houten has always kind of propped herself up as a Manson follower, but she's anything but. She is a cold-blooded killer in one of the most notorious murder rampages in United States history. So with her release now, any other uh, violent criminal or killer whose uh, crimes fall beneath the bar of Leslie Van Houten's very extreme, very uh, crimes or, that also have historical impact, that opens the door for them. And it is our fear uh, that, uh, that the floodgates in the California penal system will be unhinged. Leslie Van Houten, she, uh, she committed the crimes on Wa Waverly uh, with the Rosemary and Lito LaBianca and was not present at my uncle's murder on the evening of August 8th. Um, I, as I understand it, there are certain CDCR rules in, that uh, prohibit uh, the, uh, the offenders to contact the families. So, um, but, uh, so no, I haven't received any, uh, uh, any outreach from, from Leslie. What's your view now of Governor Gavin Newsom, knowing that he did not, at this occasion, fight? You know, I appreciate that question. I certainly have... Uh, respect for Governor Newsom and the Attorney General, but our families strongly, vehemently disagree with their decision not to file an appeal. While in prison, Van Houten earned both a bachelor and master's degree in humanity, which is the study of a humans in the individual, cultural, societal, and experiential sense, both paid in full, no student debt, and worked as a tutor for other inmates. Van Houten also decided to bank on the tragedy from what the media coverage and a book release. From that alone, she made herself a fortune. Manson doesn't own up to his share in this. I take offense to that. I take um, responsibility for my part. And part of my responsibility was helping create him. 